disclaimer! I'm the other one, you bastard! Brought to you by supporters who probably have better taste than this schmuck. Not only is this toy the final will and testament of a prestigious KO company, but it's also a failure of one. And in the end, it's just an insult to any fan of Wei Jiang. It represents nothing the company is well known for, none of the class. All I see here is a company drunk on its own hubris. Well, if you thought that was bad, you ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> There's this perception of third party that I don't feel is entirely accurate. People often assume these are small companies that are always looking out for the little guy. Filling in the gaps Hasbro won't do. The pervasive narrative is that Haztac doesn't care, but these companies do. Don't give your money to the big man, support local business. Yes, local business. Even if no one outright says it, the subtext is always there. And I got news for you, honey boo, that ain't the case. Sure, there are companies that are genuinely run by fans of the franchise and try to put out products that they know people have been aching for. Some of them even go above and beyond to stay as close to the fandom as possible, but this isn't the norm. Most companies want nothing more than your money. The reason they often try to fill the gaps left by Hasbro and Takara is because they know that's where the sales can be made. MP52 sucks. Great, ripe time to fill in the gap with an actually good one. Takara missed his chance to capitalize on the desire for collector grade small scale figures. Well, guess Iron Factory can slot in there and do its business. This is neither a praise nor criticism. Criticism. This is just a fact. Businesses want their money and they are going to release products that capitalize on that. Sometimes, however, this goes too far. Sometimes a company that has no business entering a market forces its way in there. It doesn't pay attention to the subtleties of the paradigm. It doesn't care that it's f***ing up everything along the way. And it doesn't care that it's putting out an inferior product. You'll just buy it because it's there and because the brand has secured your loyalty. And then this happens again, and again, and again and the entire paradigm shifts. What was once a vibrant niche of enjoyable experiences devolves into tactical yet misguided marketing moves. The love you once found is lost, replaced with white noise. What happens when a brand is so tone deaf that it goes down this road, changing the niche forever? Well, you get what might just be one of the worst Legends figures I have ever handled. Period. That's not hyperbole, that's just today's diagnosis. Greetings Cybertronians, get the shovel! We're holding an obituary for Zeta Superatron Mini. And possibly, third party legends as a whole. So this has to be the first time I've properly talked about Zeta toys on this channel, right? I know I've mentioned them in passing here and there for previous videos, but I haven't gone in depth before, if memory serves. So let this serve as my formal introduction. Zeta is quite literally the worst third party company in the unlicensed portion of the franchise. It's not even a contest, the amount of f***ery they're associated with is beyond ridiculous. Though this description ignores literal scam companies like Mars Toys, because if we included them, it wouldn't really be a fair fight. To explain, we gotta go back a bit. This might take a while, but it's important to set the stage so that you get a feel for how this company operates. The year is 2012. Third Party is still very much in its infancy. The scene is dominated by upgrade kits for existing characters, and we're only just seeing the glimpses of the sub-fandom's potential. We're still only dealing with the release of TFC Hercules and Make Toys Green Giant. Night Morpher is gearing up to not release anything else, and Quake Wave isn't even on the market yet. Out of nowhere comes a new company, Toy World, trying to fit into that classic style of aesthetic. It does so really well and scratches the itch for that 2005 to 10 generations charm, while Hasbro grinds the line head first into the fumble of Fall of Cybertron. Great game, horrible toy line. Hegemon was, and still is, very highly regarded. But then an aesthetic shift happened. Thrilling 30 came and went, John Warden took control of the brand, and suddenly the aesthetic shifted to a more G1 style, or rather G1 with copious amounts of waffles. Meanwhile, third party was also shifting down a new direction. It was all about that G1 accuracy, baby. And as Masterpiece entered its golden age, third party followed in its semi-realistic aesthetic. Toy World was never really able to get out of their chug stylized phase though. They sort of went half and half with the tune stylings and chug stylings at Masterpiece scale, trying to go studio walks sometimes and others. Titanium? Huh? Yeah, you can see why these things were always deeply discounted. Now, I have a lot of nostalgia for these designs. If Star, their Astro Train was one of my two first ever third party toys. Well, I ordered Iron Factory Windblade first, but received him and MMC Solace Prime before her. That said, in retrospect, God, these were shit. 
Even the classics toy is better than this garbage. Actually, no, no need for it even. The classics version is actually quite good for its time. But then, everything changes with the advent of Constructor, an accurately styled masterpiece devastator that has the presence he should have had all along with a slight Studio Ox styling, but not so much that he doesn't fit in with the existing bots. Safe to say, this combiner completely changed the game. From this point on, all inclusive combiners were out and parts forming was in. We're even seeing its effects to this day. I don't like to overstate the effect of third party on official products, but this is well and truly one of those cases. Combiner Wars Many was a pre-constructor combiner. Leggy Many was a post-constructor one. Doesn't look like Takara got the memo though, but honestly, who cares? Raiden still looks f***. Rad. Suffice to say though, this combiner takes off like a Concord in a tailwind. Not that Concord, that Concord. And this is where we see a massive change that forever alters the trajectory of Toy World and the eventual Zeta. People who are fairly new to third party might be confused as to why I'm talking about a completely different company to today's subject. Well, after the release of Constructor, something happens at Toy World. Toy World announces a slew of new combiners in the style of Constructor when suddenly a new company pops up and they start advertising those same combiners. In essence, the designers weren't happy with the way Toy World was heading, so they jumped ship and started their own company. Their own statement is that they were not compensated appropriately for Devastator, and were deeply offended by that. This, in general, is believed to this day, but Toy World hasn't ever given their side of the story. Instead, they just hired new designers and kept chugging along, or I guess MPing along. While there's no evidence to the contrary of Toy World's statements, I'm less inclined to believe them given the actions that followed. Toy World announces they're doing a Bumblebee Optimus Prime. Zeta announces announces they're doing a Bumblebee Blitzwing. Surprise, it's trash. Toy World announces it's doing a stylized Predaking under the new Kang Toys brand. Zato announces they're doing a Predaking, only it's a quickly cobbled together artwork that has people concerned about the engineering of the whole thing. To this day, it still hasn't released, with older designs taking its place. Toy World announces they're downscaling their Predaking. Zato announces they're downscaling their Superatron. That's why we have this figure today. They literally did it because Toy World was doing the same thing. And that's not including the re-releases of all their older figures, which they justify by by claiming they were never paid well for them in the first place. Then, uh, why did you keep working for the company for four years? Not to mention, these figures, they're either incredibly dated or just plain terrible. Zeta RC was supposed to be this year's Halloween special before annoying circumstances got in the way. How anyone thought it was okay to re-release this absolute piece of trash is beyond me. This toy just isn't worth it, and keep in mind, I got it for free. That's how bad it is. But it's not just Toy World Zeta has a fossilizer to pick with. Oh no, Takara's announcing a brand new Raiden project? Well, we're gonna release one too. Here's a prototype we shelved about a year ago and we're bringing it back because f you. Oh, Haslab is trying to get off the ground with their Unicron? Ah, we have a shell prototype for that as well. Let's pull that one out. This actually proved a step too far, and Hasbro quickly sent a cease and desist. Can't say I blame them, it was basically the equivalent of turning up to a fundraiser and telling someone to buy cryptocurrency instead. Since then, they've gone under a rebrand. We've now got Moon Studio and Toy Easy. One makes the aforementioned Raiden prototype from earlier. Yeah, totally not Zeta, guys. And the other makes Chinese propaganda figures based on real serving army vehicles. <laughs> Propaganda, my favorite. Now, of course, that's not to say Toy World are the complete opposite. They're definitely not saints. Also, getting into cease and getting into a cease and desist desist debacle desist desist debacle desist debacle. God, that's hard to say. Somehow stealing several CAD models for the three zero designs, as well as including thirty unedited minutes of Age of Extinction audio in the base of one of their figures. Big stupid. But like, I've seldom come across a company that's this much of a bully. The only one I can think of that's worse is Fans Toys, but even they got their comeuppance with the whole Dead End and Robot Paradise situation. But enough sidetracking. At this point, we all get who. Zeta is. This sets the stage for how this combiner set came to be. As briefly touched upon earlier, Toy World had great success with their Legend Scale Wheeljack and Beast Megatron, quality issues aside. So they thought they'd try their hand at a downscaled version of Kang Toy's Predaking. Zeta basically copies them and downscales their masterpiece scaled Superatron. Key difference though, Kang Toy's Predi is a metaphorical downscale. The aesthetic is the same, but these are primarily different toys. Think the Earthrise Deluxe and the SS86 Core Class Vans, same design, but not a literal downscale 
style of the figure. Superatron Mini, on the other hand, basically is. They haven't quite taken the CAD model and made it smaller than the budget for the Authentics line, but they've pretty much copied the general conversion beats verbatim. General conversion beats that were already kind of trash to begin with. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's jump into the vehicle modes by gyrating groin first into down thrust. Why him specifically? Well, it's not just because he's the first chronologically in the lineup, but rather he's actually the best of the bunch build quality wise. It only gets more deranged than this, fellas. Right off the bat, you can tell that Zeta put a heavy emphasis on realistic vehicle detail because in both proportions and sculpting, this is the spitting image of an F-16. All the panel work has been lifted verbatim and it's quite commendable given this is a pretty small fella, although not quite as small as other combiners in this little niche we call third party legends. Yeah, it's a chunkier figure since Zeta likes their combiners to tower over the little bots, a choice neither detrimental nor praiseworthy. It all really comes down to taste. Still, the accuracy is commendable. And that's about all this commendable because this thing really doesn't have much going for it. The majority of this gent mode is cast in that ever so frustrating Games Workshop Grey with an ever so slight sheen to it that doesn't really help it get over its boredom. Now some might say it's accurate to the original, but even though I'm no lazy eyebrow and I'm mostly oblivious to such things, that looks like a mad finish to me. Plus I don't think the real jet has these yellow lightning bolts applied to them anyway, so some creative liberties should be applied. Speaking of, the outlines may be crisp, but the actual application itself is incredible underdone. Now yellow is the hardest colour to paint, believe me I've tried. In order to get it right you need to apply multiple coats, something which they have most certainly not done here. And sure it does look a bit better on the metallic blue on the back, and yes said fin is done quite well, but uh, why isn't this glued in? Why is this a separate piece? What, you took a page out of the magic square book? Still, beyond that, there isn't really much to talk about here. I could have a right whinge about the ball joints and the weirdly shaped tabs on the front here, but given its size, it's not something to get super fussed about. Plus, he isn't exactly covered in them like previous review subjects, and it's far from the worst offender of this set. I could complain about how the die cast makes contact with the ground, but in all the months zoning down thrust, I've yet to see any paint chipping. Not quite the same for the other figures though, unfortunately. Still, uh, Good job, Zeta, for now. But other than that, this is such a nothing mode. It's basically just there to fill a quota, and considering the track record for combined vehicle modes, that's not really putting this in a good light. I guess you can try to make it look a little cooler by plonking the guns on the bottom, but whose idea was it to have square pegs squeezing into round holes? Actually, hang on a sec, maybe I'll come back to that saying later, because it might be a pretty good overarching statement. Now, of course, normally you'd expect this particular member to be a step up, given it's one of the sexier jets of the bunch, right? Rocking that crisp black F-15 mode. I mean, if they can make however many Seekers from that jet, it has to be good. Yet somehow, this is even more boring than the last one? How do you take one of the alt modes typically synonymous with Transformers, edging just shy of the Countach, and a black deco no less, something that typically makes any mold shine, and make it a snooze fest? Well, in essence, by taking the previous issues and cranking them up to 11. The lackluster application of the wing paint applications comes back in even greater force, this time half assing yellow, red, and silver? Okay, the first two I get, they're hard as f to paint, but silver is piss easy! Sometimes you can get it done in one coat, and yet somehow it's still scuffed towards the end. I guess fortunately you don't have to put up with it that much, since it's kept to the edges of the wings, only now the wings themselves have barely any paint on them. Just boring old stretches of black, not even the fins get any applications. Black repaints are cool and all, but they need breakup, lest they become boring as sh**. Basically, this is pulling a Velocitron Shadow Strip, only that figure was likely the victim of budget reallocation, where this is the victim of typical Zeta shittiness. I mean, compare this to Combiner Wars Air Raid, look at the resplendent paint applications. They even painted the stabilizers at the back, which is extra commendable given these are rubber, a material that's typically much harder to paint. Zeta didn't even bother with Sky Strike at all, even when it was all laid out for them. The line work also feels a lot more slapdash, not just in its design, which is all over the place, but also in how it's applied. Etching is a lot shallower than down thrust, really emphasizing how half fast this was. You can't even use the accuracy as an excuse because they, uh, kind of gave up. This is pulled straight from Zeta's ass, and that would be fine and all if it were actually good. I'm not one to typically care about accuracy, but if you're going to deviate, at least do so with purpose. It's like the vehicle modes of MP52 and Crimson Wings. Whatever you feel about those figures, MP52 nails an accurate vehicle mode, and Crimson Wings nails a stylized one. This kind of mode 
throws these between the two without much thought, and that's what cements the boredom. Although, admittedly, it seems like something's missing. We're not quite at the level of annoyance we should be. How about we cap it off with floppy tail fins with no logging tabs? Something Hasbro's core class was able to accomplish pretty easily, an ugly hinge bisecting the back of the jets, and the return of the ridiculous, incompatible peg system. Yeah, that's about right. Now we're getting into it. So next up should be Silver Arrow, right? I mean, he's numbered that way, so it'd make sense to cover these in that order. Well, oops, for some some bizarre reason, Silver Arrow got delayed, so we got stuck with Fly Fire and Catapult in the meantime. That said, I'm going to swap the order that I cover these in, just so I can maintain the downward trajectory of insanity. But for now though... <laughs> <laughs> okay, I have to give some credit to Zeta here. The Sea Harrier isn't exactly an easy jet to turn into a robot. Matter of fact, Harriers in general are really difficult to do, which is probably why Studio Series Shatter sidestepped the issue by going for a different jet entirely. It's a pretty sleek and round jet, while robots usually have to be blocky. Well, mostly anyway. So, how does Zeta work around this? Why, by turning this into a balloon animal. For Catapult, they've taken the general shape of the Harrier and rounded off practically everything. I honestly wonder if this thing could even be flight-worthy in the first place, given how Here's obese it is. Man. The squished cockpit crashes headfirst into the oversized VTOLs, which sort of blend into where the wings are supposed to splay out, but really don't with all this jank on top. Then the wings have a Photoshop skew effect applied to them, stretching them along the X-axis and making this thing look more like the jet equivalent of a pigeon. They also wobble around like no one's business because the tips have no no locking points. Come on, it's not that hard, guys. Just a small tab and hey presto, but no, too much effort for little old Zeta. Then you got the robot shins jutting out the back, which on its own would be fine. The aerial bots are typically jets with robot bricks underneath them. Transformers fans should be used to this by now. But when you have it hanging off while the actual jet tapers into the tail section with no cohesion attempted, yeah, this just screams lazy. As does the mechanical detail, again. It's been pulled from the designer's ass with no rhyme or reason, but hey, at least they molded in the little doodah at the front. At least they molded in the landing wheels, even though they don't function and the real wheels are at the bottom. Look, as I said earlier, I don't usually care that much about accuracy. As someone who's been collecting chug figures for years, I'm no stranger to stylized alt modes. I'm the kind of person who doesn't really care that Leggy Breakdown is more of a Jalpa than a Countach. Hell, go full crazy and give us Alpha Bravo in the lineup. Personally, I find it more interesting anyway. My problem isn't the lack of accuracy, but rather the lack of focus. Zeta just doesn't have a consistent aesthetic in mind. They're merely counting on the facts that people will want some sort of legend scale superior and will buy this out of a drive for completionism. <laughs> they don't have to strive for a consistent aesthetic because the consumer base they believe they have probably won't care. It's been part of their modus operandi from the very beginning, way back when they were still designing toys for toy worlds. They've never broken out of it and discovered their own identity. Their identity is, here's a vaguely recognizable G1 character in a scale you want. And Catapult is where we really start digging into such issues. Now for the last of the Limbots, hypothetically I could give Flyfire some slack. The Phantom 2 is also a notoriously difficult jet to do. Once again, Hasbro just flat out refused to try with their Studio Series version. And although Zeta took a shot at it previously with their Bumblebee Blitzwing, allegedly it was one of the worst third party toys ever released. As a stylized Phantom stretched and squashed for the purpose of forming a fully functioning robot, I reckon it does okay. Least better than that Poor excuse for a Harrier, so bad I can't think of a good pun to insult it. In essence, they've taken the engine section in the middle and extruded it to the rest of the vehicle. It doesn't look too bad, and the paintwork on the main body does a lot of the legwork, which is ironic given this turns into an arm. They've applied this lovely metallic fleck and gloss sheen to the red plastic, sort of similar to the recent Dinobot offerings from New Age. It's nowhere near as lustrous, but it gets the job done. They've also gone back to the semi-accurate detailing, which looks far better than when they awkwardly try to do something different. Not on the wings, mind you. Those are way off. It's mainly the chassis that goes accurate, but even then, the wings aren't terrible. There's actually purpose to these lines, drawing your attention to the main body with layered angling. See? It's not that hard. But yeah, for the most part, I could hypothetically call this one of the better jets in this set. I mean, yeah, the arms are a smidge egregious, but we have the sign for that. Probably the only time I can use the sign in this set, which is disappointing. And sure, the shins still are kinda sticking out the bottom, but it's just one small issue compared to one issue and all of this shit. 
Yes. That said, emphasis on the hypothetical, because this alt mode goes from one of the best to one of the worst in a few seconds. As a long-time Legends collector, I've always known to be careful with my figures. Some of my older ones? Sure, I broke those, but I quickly learned to be gentle with my collection. As such, I haven't broken a figure for years. Well, aside from one instance where it was on purpose so I could demonstrate an issue. What the f The first time I tried to transform this out of the box, this joint crumbled to pieces. It didn't snap or crack, it's crumbled. This indicates that in the box it was already assembled in a way that stressed the plastic. Why they used a clip joint instead of a pin baffles me to no end. Or at least does so until you consider the plastic quality of these pieces. I'll go into more detail later, but in essence, if they used a pin, it probably would have caused the same effect due to how brittle this stuff is. At that point, maybe they should have designed a thicker joint? They've already stylized the alt mode plenty to make the engineering work, so what's a bit more at this point? It's not just me, mind you. I did some research and was able to come across two other cases of this breakage. It's not extremely widespread, but it's widespread enough that some people believe it affects all copies. Even if it doesn't, this is really poorly designed. None of the other jets had this issue, so they could have easily circumvented it. Now from here, I could go into the other issues of paint, where the yellow and blue look really wispy and haphazard, but honestly, I don't care. This toy has already committed the cardinal sin of falling to bits out of the box in a way that cannot be repaired, so none of the other issues really matter. I mean, the designers didn't care enough to fix the plastic quality or add better joints, so at this point, why should I care about going further with this portion of the script? But if you really want to talk about lack of care, you need look no further than Silver Arrow. Of course, hypothetically, a delay with a product could ensure that it's given the final push it's needed to be the best it can be. I mean, y'all all know the Miyamoto quote, even if he never actually said that, so it has to be beneficial, right? Well, Zeta flat out didn't bother, because this alt mode, I can't describe it as anything other than rubbish. Without hyperbole, this is easily the worst alternate mode I've come across all year, and there's been some hefty competition with the likes of Bumblebee Soundwave and Authentic's f C. So, what's wrong with this? Well, you've got panel lines that rival Classics Ironhide, exposed joints that evoke the incoherence of Earthrise Ironhide, nothing holds together well like Movie Masterpiece Ironhide, this really must be a simp for the worst Ironhide molds imaginable, or maybe it's just an Ironhide simp and the poor lad has been unlucky with toys until recently, or maybe Zeta just sucks. That's probably it. The last point in particular bothers me especially, at least with the other bad alt modes they mostly held together. No matter what I do, no matter how closely I follow the instructions, there's always this bow in the middle. I know Concord's historically kept having bits flying off, but at this rate, the passengers are gonna fly out as well. And speaking of the Concords, this isn't a Concord. A Concord is supposed to be sleep and dynamic, and third party doesn't have to contend with issues of accuracy and legality. They could have gone as accurate as they liked or as stylized as they liked, but predictably, they've yet again shit out some sort of middle ground that doesn't satisfy either. The windows on the nose cone feel awfully bloated, as if the last review wasn't enough on that front. They've done the downward fold thing, but it cuts through said windows, ruining cohesion, and just makes the whole thing sad. Mate, this cockpit is tiny. You're including a feature that just makes it feel worse at this size. They've gone with the two accurate gold windows, which is commendable, but the gold they've chosen looks more like the type you'd find on a McDonald's Happy Meal toy. It's way too close to the yellow side of things, way too far away from bronze. It looks like what a child would paint with a custom paint job, not an expensive third-party deco. It's even worse considering this is most of the paint on the design. Your attention is drawn towards it because there's nothing else aside from the tip done in gunmetal. And the tampographs on the back, speaking of, wow, these are sloppy. The amount of bleed on these is simply inexcusable. This isn't borderline knockoff territory. This is knockoff territory. And speaking of knockoffs, this is where we get into an issue that's affected all figures but is most noticeable on Silver Arrow. The plastic quality on these, it's absolute trash. It's the same plastic that Toy World used to use back in the early days of third party, which is the same plastic used on a bunch of cheap shitty knockoffs you can find these days. I'm of course referring to those dubious eBay sales that they pass off as the real thing, but surprise, you got duped. It's incredibly lightweight and ridiculously brittle, which you've seen evidence of previously. I know it's hard to get across plastic quality in video form, short of excessive action figure violence, but this plastic is essentially on the same level as the f 
Authentics. Interestingly, Zeta fans have not only defended this use of plastic over the years, but gone further and praised its use as genius. The TLDR of the argument is that when you make a figure the size of a Titan, you need lightweight plastic to make sure it can stand and pose properly. Two things though. One, while weight definitely is an issue for combiners, there are other methods you can use, such as sturdier joints, combiner skeletons, and simplifying the engineering. Last method is actually the most effective, but for some bizarre reason, Zeta appears to be allergic to such. And two, this isn't f masterpiece. It's a f legends figure. Oh no! The weight is going to have issues when the final product is only the size of a leader class figure. And perhaps this weak source plastic could be forgiven if the figure had any decent paintwork or sculpting. I mean, Crimson Wing didn't have the best materials, but he made up for it in the looks department. As mentioned earlier, though, there's really no paint to make this thing look interesting. Furthermore, the wings are basically just huge planks of off-white plastic. There's practically no detail here whatsoever, save for the seam lines from the nightmarish transformation. The one time pulling random details out of their ass would have worked, so they've decided to go for the most boring kind of accuracy. Why is it boring specifically? Well, because they've taken this weird middle ground between the rounded tune accuracy and the sharpened official vehicle accuracy. It's neither angular nor purposefully curved, so you end up with something that's not accurate to either. Stylization is cool, but this isn't stylization. This is just laziness. Even the color choice is misguided. Off-white is a real difficult color to get right. Lest you end up falling into Games Workshop gray territory. But Zeta? The f*** you talking about? Of course they're gonna face plant into that. These alt modes. Jesus Christ, they suck. Slowly but surely, these jets have gone from bad to worse. Plummeting into the abyss and preventing you from finding your way back. The aerial bots shouldn't be this hard. In essence, they're jets with robot blocks underneath. Mayhaps there's a way to create fully accurate vehicles without the underkibble and still retain the combining gimmick, but not at this scale and not under Zeta's poor understanding of robot engineering. Just take a look at the Combiner Wars versions. As stylized as they are, they unmistakably capture the essence of all these alt modes, except in the case of Alpha Bravo, but he's an actually good example of doing something new and interesting. Every time Zeta strays from the safety net of accuracy, it's purely for the purpose of half assing it. But who cares about this alt mode since they're mainly meant to be combined anyway, you may ask. Well, perhaps you could get away with that ideology in the masterpiece scale. Not that I'd agree, but these are Legends figures. They're supposed to be played with at a desk, no matter how high-end they are. And in some cases, they break before you're even able to get to that point. Not to mention, these are the modes they're packaged in. This is your first exposure to the set. Right out the gate, they're just not respecting their audience. They don't even look good in a lineup. Often, even if the alt modes fail in a few areas, they still end up coming together as a team. Seda doesn't really offer that with this particular set. There are too many grievances all round, both minuscule and infuriating. This feels like an amateur project, not something from a veteran company. I don't even think you can call Zeta a veteran company, though. Clearly, in all their years of unofficial Transformer designs, they've learned jack s***. Mate, f*** this. It's been seven goddamn pages and I've only just finished the alt modes. I gotta move on, or else I'll just get stuck in an endless cycle of repeating the same points over and over. Much like Zeta itself doesn't learn from its mistakes and traps its customers in an endless loop. So by this point, you guys probably know the drill, the way everything works, I kind of get rid of the script, I go on unscripted, and I start talking about the transformation. I discuss the pros and the cons and go through each step as it comes. Maybe I draw attention to certain things here and there, but for the most part, it'd be a chill experience. But this time, the transformations are so f bad that I need to explain them in much greater detail. Everything about these transformations is wrong. Let me repeat that because I don't think it's fully sunk in. Everything about these transformations is wrong. You may be asking, why am I going to such lengths? Well, in the words of that toy guy, PAIN. Starting off with down thrust, the first thing you have to do is bisect the air intake at the front to free up the joints. These are incredibly finicky and annoying. This portion of the back fin folds around to make room for another joint. This feels incredibly tacked on and pointless, and it doesn't lock in anywhere while in jet mode. It's f***ing 
stupid. A bunch of panels unclipped from the backpack. It's very haphazard and unsatisfying. The tabs on the back also have a tendency to break, given they're made out of really soft yet brittle plastic. Not even sure why these are here, given this tabs into the backpack anyway. You separate the legs, and suddenly you're hit with sliding rails. Need I remind you what sliding rails leads to a few years down the track? And it may look like these back panels lock the legs into place, but no, it's a separate mechanism. I have to ask if the solution of sliding rails longevity was right there, why not use it? Before closing everything up, you have to fold out the foot. These have no heels whatsoever and are incredibly loose. The backpack consists of a metric f ton of tiny hinges, haphazardly folding together so that both halves of the backpack can meet and form something that's far from cohesive. I'm fairly certain this style is colloquially known as spaghetti engineering and already its use on third-party masterpieces dubious huh? at best. Shrunken down to a Legends figure, it's inexcusable. This is not how you engineer small-scale transformers. Not even Magic Square stoops to this level. You'd think the way the arms fold out would be cool, given the automorph in the panels on the sides. But no, said arms have no locking tabs in vehicle mode, so it's a floppy disaster waiting to happen. And then the arms bring back the sliding rails again, because f*** you! The fists fold out and they've got no locking points, so push them too far and he starts doing a curtsy. Guess he got that from his Uncle Highbrow. Finally, the head folds out of a cavity in the front. There's not much inherently wrong with this step, but Jesus, this looks ugly. So yeah, all in all, a pretty rubbish transformation. Now, ready to do a variation of such three more times? Sky Strike fortunately has a better time of having the legs separate, since the back panels don't cover up the backpack struts. But he piles more shit on top by having said back panels not tab in properly and having the wings often clash with the side panels when you're trying to fold them up. Honestly, I would have preferred if they just made them sweep backwards and avoid the whole folding in system entirely. But that wouldn't have been possible with the weight issues, thanks to these tiny ass feet. Oh, and sometimes the struts get stuck in the backpack for whatever reason. It's a pain in the ass, but then again, so is everything about this set. Catapult reaches a new low, as the legs now have two sets of sliding rails instead of one. This toy can be the next hybrid style black convoy in the next couple of years, mark my words. And this time you have to open up the torso to access everything, and Jesus Christ, what am I looking at? This nightmarish cacophony of double and triple hinges, you can barely make sense of it. Gone is the admittedly clever automorph, now replaced with hinges on very specific yet concerningly flimsy rails. I'm scared I'm gonna break this thing at this rate. Also, careful you don't accidentally pull out the combiner joint, given it has no actual locking tabs to keep it in place while the torso is open, and relies on being tabbed into the door. And even after that, the torso barely f holds together. This shouldn't be this complicated, it's a goddamn Scrabble City limb, not a Megatron or some sh**. From here, it's the same old frustrations. Sliding rail arms, fists with no stopping points, f***ery in the backpack. Oh, and now it doesn't actually lock together properly thanks to them not accounting for the clearance in the tabs. F*** this thing. Oh, and the head has to fold out of the backpack now thanks to the lack of space in the torso. The joints are incredibly flimsy and have no locking points. F*** this thing. Flyfire is, in essence, the same as Catapult with only two added frustrations. The torso is now much tighter, so the worries of breakages are even greater. And of course, there's the breakage, so now he's a mandatory part. Transformer. This actually has the most solid backpack of the group, feeling purposeful in spite of its woeful engineering ideology. Though, I'm starting to see evidence of even more cracks forming in the hinges. Flyfire is practically decomposing in front of me. This review was like a ticking time bomb before this toy becomes unusable! And yet, somehow Silver Arrow is even worse. In essence, he is the Ragnar of this set, endlessly overcomplicated to the point where I dread transforming it. The wingtips unpeg from the sides, and this whole skeleton system on the top of the plane on tabs. Look at it wobbling around. This is spaghetti engineering on steroids. More panels fold out from the sides, unlocking the upper body in multiple ways. Thing is, you have to get the backpack out of the way in the process, even if it's folded out. It's incredibly stupid. The sliding rails return, and they're on die-cast metal, which is just asking for trouble. Though in this instance, I reckon it's okay, as the panels fold into the legs to support the frame. It's not relying on plastic that will break down over time, fortunately. Although given how brittle the plastic itself is, the tiny hinges inside may have another tale to tell. Just gonna say, I still don't trust these. You're now left with this disgusting inner skeleton. These parts are incredibly thin and flimsy. It's honestly asking for trouble. Heaven forbid Silver Arrow ever takes a shelf dive. Getting the head out is fine enough, but the locking tabs weren't toleranced properly. So the whole thing flops around without care. Meanwhile, the pectorals have the opposite problem. They're so tight, you have to stretch the plastic into place to get them to work. Again, I'm scared shitless I'm gonna break the damn thing. Lord knows there are already countless broken copies out there. Oh, and be careful not to knock out the breastplates. For some bizarre reason, these aren't actually glued in place. What was the f***? 
Blue stick, too expensive for the oh-so-frugal Zeta. The arms then offer two separate sliding rails, and while the wrists stay in place due to friction, the elbows flop around like it's my democracy manifest after seeing AI try to draw lewd art. Get it away from me! Get away from me! Get it away from me! And then, the backpack. Oh, sweet Jesus. First, you have to rotate the nose cone to the side. Look, I get you're allergic to kibble, but for Christ's sake, this is the laziest way to hide it. This tiny little panel unpegs and clips into the back. Actually, stupidity of the system aside, even calling it clipping into the back is a stretch. It more just holds on to dear life with nothing but hopes and dreams. This ain't securing sh the nose cone then accordions in on itself multiple times, with each peg becoming less secure than the last. You're basically left with a backpack that, again, looks like an amateur designed this rather than a veteran company. People often write this off as just a complex transformation, but that's not really the case. The steps themselves are relatively simple, they're just handled piss poorly. Crimson Wings is an incredibly complex figure, and it handles its conversion really smoothly. Toy World's Freedom Leader functions rather similarly, the trailer for Magic Square Menasaur also, and more recently, movie masterpiece Blackout handles its complexity quite well. It's not the amount of steps that have plunged this transformation into an abyss of frustration. It's how each step is handled. Every step of the way has something wrong with it, and you're never left satisfied at the end. While Silver Arrow doesn't have nearly as bad a transformation as figures like Ragnar or Thunder Leader, he is the Ragnar of his specific set. I don't want to transform this thing ever again. It's blows. And here's the thing, those two examples are singular figures. This is a set of five. How the flying f do you screw up five figures in a row? Do you not see the absurdity of this? F up once, shame on you. F up twice, shame on me. F up five times, you gotta wonder, aside from morbidly curious f nuts like myself, who the hell stuck through this? How many times have you gotta use sliding rails before you realize that maybe they were a bad idea? This transformation from start to finish has been f awful. That toy guy referred to this as if bold forms made a combiner, and honestly, yeah, I can see that. Though I gotta say, the circumstances for this are worse. That was a second attempt at a one-man design team. Zeta is a multiple design company with at least a decade of experience, not that it shows, mind you. This is why I opted to walk through it step by step. It's taken roughly 1,500 words to do so, but it's something that's needed to be examined in greater detail. And you'd think maybe you'd get some respite when you get to the robot mode, but nope! If anything, things have gotten worse. Well, not worse than the transformation, but definitely worse than the vehicle modes. Jumping right into downthrust, he's basically the embodiment of third-party syndrome. For those not aware, it's a term that originated from Haztac only collectors, used to criticize the weird nature of some third-party designs. Peeling back the bias against non-licensed Transformers toys, it typically comes comes into play when third-party companies don't really settle on a particular aesthetic and just wing it, expecting people to buy anyway because Hasbro isn't making that particular character. Sufferers of such ailments include several of the older fans' toys and TFC releases, as well as the majority of Toy World's pre-constructor lineup. Thing is, it's been quite a while since the contributing factors to this ailment were a thing. Hasbro's making practically everyone these days, so there's no room for error in this aesthetic. Plus, third-party toys have been around for a decade, and people are much more used to companies honing in on a particular aesthetic. Accurate it's all stylized. Yet for some bizarre reason, Zeta still seems to suffer from such. Even with releases beyond this, like Moon Studio Radiotron. We've already seen it in the Jets with haphazard sculpting and wonky proportions. But nothing can prepare you for the robot modes. And as said just a moment ago, Downthrust embodies this to the T. The general aesthetic strokes of the character are there, but only in a checklist manner. The actual essence of the character is completely lost. You can tell they didn't care about the design, because that lack of care is reflected in how off it looks. The head sculpt is easily the biggest offender. This is less a skydive head sculpt so much as a generic asset flip sculpt put inside a vague skydive helmet. The face is incredibly nondescript and the helmet lacks any and all detail. It sort of looks like they heard what skydive was supposed to look like but never actually saw any pictures of him. You compare this to the Combiner Wars version, sure it's stylized owing that to the Prime Wars trilogy line work but it's clear who this character is supposed to be. I don't know who this is supposed to be at all or at least I wouldn't if it weren't 
for the rest of the body. The paint doesn't help, as covered multiple times already, red and yellow are the most difficult colours to work with in terms of paint, so it makes sense orange would be the same. To compensate, you need to put multiple thin coats over a long period of time. Zeta got lazy though, and instead just thickens the paint itself. As a result, it washes out any and all detail, which already wasn't a lot. And can you believe this is actually one of the better head sculpts in this set? Yeah, it's mostly downhill from here. Mind you, you get a lot more leeway for f***ing with a Legends head sculpt, given the size, and even then this looks hideous. The arms are also pretty rubbish. The gunmetal is, once again, haphazardly applied, even outright missing the lines at certain points. He also has a bad case of Popeye forearms, since the elbows have to fit inside the hollow chassis of them. Sliding rails, not even once. I mean, Christ, he can't even bend his elbows 90 degrees! I know on such a small figure that might seem like nitpicking, but depending on where you got this, it cost anywhere between 70 and 90 bucks. That's new age big boy territory, and you're telling me that's acceptable? His fists can hold the two guns, but there's a small problem. They're plugged in using slots, not round pegs. The fists also aren't made of a softer plastic like Iron Factory Sea Spray, so once they're in, they're incredibly hard to get out. They didn't even make the tabs longer so you could push them from behind, which was something Iron Factory Soundwave got right. Basically, they're making mistakes that Iron Factory has gotten right for years, which is f pathetic. The torso vaguely matches the tune design, the general shape is there, but once again they've pulled the mechanical detail out of their ass, and it loses any and all charm as a result. The paint choice also washes out a lot of the detail, making it look soft and fuzzy. With Flyfire, it was a base of red plastic with extra finishes applied on top, so the details could really shine, well, at least in vehicle mode. Here, they were too cheap to cast this in red plastic, and too stupid to use a paint that doesn't f*** with the sculpt. Not that the sculpt is any good, mind you. It really can confuses me, because this is supposed to be a downscale of their masterpiece offering, and that version blended the tune and toy styles to, well, I don't want to say great effect because it still looks ugly as shit, but it certainly looks better than this. Oh, and paint chipping happens super easily. Great. Beyond that, one thing you'll notice is that each member has diecast on the front. This may seem a bit strange because typically diecast is used in the feet to help balance the figure. Well, there are three actual reasons why it's used in this manner. Firstly, the feet are basically useless. The amount of volume here simply wouldn't work on diecast. And even then, having diecast ball joints is a horrible idea for longevity. Secondly, the backpacks on these are ridiculous. I personally don't mind the size of them, but between this and the feet, they're basically on the verge of toppling the figure over. It's like this for all the members, not just downthrust. By using these huge chunks, it counteracts this issue. I actually think this use is an alright one in this instance. Now, could it be better if they weren't used in junction with sliding rails? Absolutely, but using them to compensate for backpack issues? Sure, it's a necessity, go for it. And thirdly, well, as mentioned earlier, the plastic on these is a joke. We're dealing with knockoff level materials here, so how does Zeta create the illusion of quality? Diecast, that's how! If you pick up this little bastard, he feels weighty, however, when you examine the plastic quality, that illusion is shattered. The diecast here isn't being used to make a good figure better, it's being used to make a shitty figure actually seem passable. Yes, for the first time ever, the stance that diecast only creates the illusion of quality is actually accurate. In this instance, the metal is most definitely a blatant lie. I warned you, I warned everyone, but no, don't listen to perspective, he's just an asshole. But I'm not just an asshole, I'm a correct asshole. Well, you know what they say about broken clocks? Staring at them is about as entertaining as watching your show. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, that's fair. And to round things off, the hinges protrude from his anus, and also hinder the waist articulation. I get he's a combiner and there are going to be sacrifices, but nothing in this robot mode makes up for issues like this. I mean, sure, the articulation has pretty much everything a robot of this size at this price tag should have, short of an ab crunch, but newsflash, the details here make posing him boring as sh**. Hell, even getting him into a boring pose doesn't feel good as all the plastic feels rickety. This is a Legends figure, posing him should be fun. And don't blame the Sunbow chart, the designers didn't bother following it, or any clear sense of aesthetics, so that's no excuse. Downthrust is just flat out bad in robot mode. He's not the worst Legends robot mode I've ever handled, but him and the others are definitely the worst I've handled this year, aside from maybe Authentics RC. Even then though, it's real close. And when you get to the other robot modes, well, it's more of the same, save for a few minor differences here and there. Sky Strike is almost identical in his issues, save for an even worse head sculpt. Between the weird lips and the racist caricature squinted eyes, he looks like he's going to proclaim to the world that he's Skylar White, yo! But beyond 
beyond that, it's mostly the same. Instead of Popeye forearms, we've got elongated forearms, but they're basically the same effect in this instance. No 90 bend at the elbow, vague chest that misses the essence of the character, paint chipping, boring posing, rickety joints, exposed kibble hinges that f with the waist swivel, identical articulation, similar size. Oh, sorry, there's one key difference. The shoulders aren't tolerance properly, so the automorph sometimes untransforms. Yay, one small difference that makes him worse than downthrust. Yep. Catapult is where things deviate a bit, but we're still neck deep in feces territory here. Admittedly, the head sculpt is actually all right. Nothing amazing, and it's definitely held back by its over-application of thick and orange, but it at least feels like the character. I can tell right away who this is supposed to be, unlike the other members. Looks completely out of place with the rest of the body, though. What the <laughs> f am I even looking at? They've messed with the proportions of the toon and toy so that instead of having a brick for a body, it looks like he's wearing a life raft vest. Combined with the returning metallic red paint, this looks less like a defined purposeful torso and more like something you'd find in a loot crate bundle. I get they're trying to hide the combiner joints, but newsflash, it's literally easier to hide joints like that inside a giant cube than a half cube, half hourglass figure. And why are the shoulders so far down? This is something you almost never see on a figure these days. Last time I can think of is Combiner Wars Megatron. Only that figure looked fine in an A stance and weird with its arms stretched out. This is the opposite. They look out of place straight down, but when you rotate it forward, they look... Fine? What? Though none of this compares to the annoyance of dealing with the wings. These flop around like a plate of jelly in a tokusatsu show. In general, all of the Limbots should have had locking tabs for these. Lacking them means longevity for these pieces is called into question, but for Catapult specifically, this is really annoying. And keep in mind, this is on top of all the previous issues. Yes, the backpack is a little better, keeping to itself and staying out of the way of posing, but the posing is still boring as shit thanks to the lackluster aesthetic. The details on the torso are still too soft, the forearms are still too long, the guns are still annoying to use, the feet still suck. Also, why do these all have light piping but use painted over eyes? Is this what they call denied piping? It's like this toy was personally and purposefully designed and meticulously calculated to piss me off. <laughs> I'm in despair. This horrible figure has left me in despair. Bear. Also, while I was scripting the combined mode, I found two more issues. Firstly, the hip skirts have a tendency to get stuck in the waist section. There are no stopping points back there, so if you're not careful, they get stuck like underpants going up the crack. Furthermore, the die cast has been miscast. There's a piece of gunk in there that's caused the molding to go wonky on both legs. Zeta really didn't give a sh** with the production of this set, did they? Also, to close things off, while I've been filming, I've discovered two more issues. Turn the head to the right, perfect fine. Turn the head slightly to the left. Ah, now it's Lucy f***ing Goosey. Just flops f***ing around if you try turning it to the left because f*** you, I guess. And also, this guy and the next guy apparently have wrist swivels, but they don't work with the gun because of the way that it's molded, and also they are magic square type wrist swivels, so they pop off really easily. Because this figure is designed to make me pissed off. Well, at least we're more than halfway through the robot modes. Can't be too much more pain on the horizon. Fly fire is mostly the same as what you've seen. You've still got the bad posing, low shoulders, elongated forearms, bad feet, and exposed hinges below the crotch plate. In this context, hinges sound like an STI, but I feel that insult is too good for this figure. Two additions to this particular entry, though. Firstly, the torso has extra white paint. White chalky paint. That chips like a motherfucker. I don't know what type of paint this is, but I have always hated its use. It never looks natural, and it's always prone to scratches. And beyond that, the torso is now a flat plank of nothing. The one time they could have actually used the base plastic to make this thing look pristine, and they still had to use the shitty metallic red, only with no detail this time. And secondly, <laughs> the face sculpt. Yeah, this is the worst head sculpt of the set by far. There's not even any contest. The other members aren't Drug users. I like meth. I I like meth. <laughs> Shh. <laughs> Stop right there, criminal scum. You violated my mother. <laughs> you ruined my wife. <laughs> I will destroy you. <laughs> also, can I just say that the incorporation of these fake landing gear wheels is really unsightly. They end up looking like pus pimples, and it results in all the limbot torsos looking diseased. Why are they all so far to the left? Do you even need uh. landing gear on a Legends figure? Ah, right. Die cast on the shins, and it would scratch otherwise. 
Except they molded wheels on the diecast anyway, so it's already prone to shipping! Ah! <laughs> Okay, call it Dr. Lockdown. You can't be getting that angry just yet. A certain someone still must be discussed. You know, for how dodged the transformation is, this guy isn't the worst of the lineup in robot mode. In fact, I go as far as saying he's the closest to looking like an actual transformer in this mode out of the group. Not in vehicle mode, mind you, but at least something here functions. The general silhouette and design cues actually look like the design it's supposed to represent, unlike the last few examples. The face sculpt is a little bug-eyed, but at least he doesn't look like a drug <laughs> addict, though at this point that might be Stockholm Syndrome. The torso vaguely looks like the cartoon, which is a step above what we've had prior with these AI-generated approximations. He's got actual color blocking going on, meaning his design doesn't just look like a boring slab of nothing. Even the posing works alright. It's not perfect, mind you, and he still looks a bit clunky in most poses, but it's leagues better than the others. He's got an actual ab crunch, as well as allowing the backpack to hinge out of the way so that he can get the full waist rotation. It's obvious some actual thoughts went into his design, as opposed to whatever the others were doing. Maybe that's a result of the delay, but at this stage, I don't think we'll ever know. Zeta aren't exactly the most communicative. They've got their ear to the ground on what will deliver the most profit, but it's not a two-way street. The accessories are also okay. The others are pretty stinky with their pistols, but these here actually use round pegs. He does have a bit of a case of the combined cannon looking out of place on the core robot, but that's a pretty typical problem for combiners. One mode always ends up looking weird with the other's weapons. And in this instance, I'd prefer they prioritize the combined accessories over the core robot ones. Not everyone can be the Magic Square Menasaur designer after all. That being said, Silver Arrow ain't without flaws. I can discuss them without getting infuriated, but I still have to discuss them in the first place. Firstly, the ankles are basically useless. Since they're hinged in the wrong spot, they always look unnatural. They're also only affecting the toes, meaning anything slightly too dynamic, and he topples ready for a launch smash combo. Secondly, the paint kinda stinks. The white on top of the diecast is fine, albeit not color matched at all, but the yellow and red are incredibly lackluster, with lots of bleed from underneath, though this has been an issue for the whole set, so I won't dwell on it too much. Thirdly, some of the plastic choices. I really dislike this mustard yellow they've gone with. Don't pull the accuracy card either, because the toy was chrome gold and the tune was pizza cheese. We stand pizza cheese, we don't stand mustard. Even the Combiner Wars orange was better than this shit. The red is also a bit iffy. It's really dull and causes the line work to sort of vanish into the design. It's not as icky as the mustard, but the torso details are something you kinda wanna see, unless you've just given up halfway through and are pushing through for a paycheck. And finally, the backpack. Now, I don't have any problem with using backpacks in general. Although I've hated the engineering behind the previous four, I found the backpacks themselves perfectly acceptable, especially for a combiner. Sure, I can complain about the exposed hinges behind their anuses, but that's not the backpacks themselves. Thing is, these backpacks are large but relatively light. Silver Arrow's backpack is relatively small but incredible incredibly dense. The parts count and amount of folding here is much higher, evidenced by them needing to use three sets of die-cast balancers instead of a duo in the legs. So I have to wonder, what's going to happen to the knees over time? Already one of the knees is going loose from just storing him in the box, so how long until the figure can't stand at all? On top of that, the panels here are just barely holding on. If you're not careful, this whole thing has a tendency to fall into a billion pieces. Again, as time goes by and the joints break down, how sturdy is this backpack going to be? Backpacks aren't a problem in themselves, it's more so the engineering behind them. And in this case, I find that engineering detrimental to the longevity. And I know some of you are going to complain in the comments, saying it's supposed to be left in combined mode, but like... It's a transformer, is this not? Shouldn't all of the modes function properly? Otherwise, why not get a non-transforming action figure? It's my goal to discuss all the pros and cons with a transformer in these reviews, and I see this as a perfectly valid flaw. Doubly so for a Legends figure in a scale meant to be flipped back and forth. Thing is, I don't think Zayd has taken that into account. With both the Jet and Robot modes, they've demonstrated time and time again that they simply do not care. Everything's secondary to the combined mode, and I feel that's not really how designers should go about things. They're already using a combiner skeleton that comprises half this thing's mass. What further sacrifices do you need? Especially in the robot modes, they are coasting by on recognition alone. Though even then, they're really pushing it. It's a Legends Aerial Bot set. You'll buy it because Magic Square Menasaur and New Age Devastator need a buddy to fight. Don't complain, don't wait, f*** you, give us money! And in this instance, it doesn't really take as long to go through all of the issues because they're all the same. They didn't just make them 
mistakes once, they made them four times for all the limb bots, then invented new mistakes for Silver Arrow. The robot modes are clearly the modes that got the least attention, and it really shows. Yes, I reckon the vehicle modes are worse, but these here are far more shameless. We know it's possible to hit all three modes properly, seen with Iron Factory, Brutey, Magic Square, Menu, New Age, Devi. Hell, even Hulky did it alright, albeit with a bit of older third party jank. But for the moment, let's give Superatron the benefit of the doubt. Let's see if their primary focus on combined mode method actually has some merit. Let's transform this guy and see if at least one aspect of this figure can reach the table without any frustrating conundrums. So, the million dollar question, is the conversion to combined mode worse than vehicle to robots? Well, no, for two reasons. One, it just isn't as bad, for multiple reasons. And two, well, we're kinda used to all the sh** from earlier, so there are no new surprises here. So thankfully I don't need to script this portion, which means I can finally use the Patreon shoutouts, yippee! Now addressing the elephant in the room, yes, he does use a combiner skeleton and it comprises of the most percentage of a combiner that I've covered on this channel. Sure, Leggy Menasaur has a higher percentage, but I haven't covered him, so this is the biggest I've done so far. And that's fine, my problems don't lie with this, my problems just lie with the issues with everyone else. A skeleton is meant to alleviate issues like weight and overcomplicated engineering, but in this instance it's more of a crutch. Because those issues are still there, yes, the conversion is better here than previously, but that doesn't make it good by any means. One of the really annoying parts is hypothetically you should be able to convert these from jet mode to combined mode. But because of this part, because of all these hinges, you kinda need to untransform, then retransform the whole thing. So it's easier to go from bot mode. It's essentially a case where every single limb is basically DX9 scrapper. Which come the f on, man. If your combined mode is supposed to be the main thing, at least make the engineering fun. So in essence, you pretty much just bring the feed in like you normally would back to jet mode, and then collapse the legs into place. And then you slide these panels up halfway as if you're about to transform the thing, but don't go all the way yet. Because now what you need to do is untab the backpack like so, bring this section all the way down to the back in the middle, and then collapse the whole thing together. But even then, you can't collapse the whole thing at all because this can't be plugged in properly. From here, you gotta get the arms into place and fold it down like so. And the reason we can't plug this in is because we have to get it into the combined mode first. You've got a peg here, and it fits into the slot of the back here. So it pegs in like so, and then these two bits secure it in place. Although at the moment, they don't seem to be cooperating. There we go. Then you can peg that into place, and then you can peg these into place, and then you can peg in the back into place, and we're finally good with the leg. Just gotta make sure these are all clipped together as well. This whole thing is just stupid, like, this should just plug right in and it's good to go. And I appreciate them making a really sturdy joint because that's not coming off at all. But just to get here, it's a bit of a pain in the ass. And this f***er basically functions the same. One thing I will admit though, is that the legs are done quite well. At first it just seems like they peg on securely enough, but then you've got this extra support at the back that really locks it well into place. It's super sturdy, and one thing I really like is that it's actually colour-coded to work with the rest of the leg. That's cool, and I don't remember it being done on many combiners before, aside from maybe a couple of the Hasbro ones. But even then it was the Scramble City type, so it didn't really matter anyway. But yeah, that's the legs done. They are very sturdy, but having to untransform the whole things is kind of at least Silverbolt makes a bit more sense because it's basically just turning into a cube, although not a very good cube, mind you. Fold in the head as you normally would, unslot the backpack and get it out of the way, that's going to re-slot later, but it's going to fall apart in the meantime because f*** you. The shoulders basically untab and fold out halfway around the thing, don't know why, it's a bit silly. You fold in the toes like so. What you want to do is get the legs around and out of the way so that this will sit behind the legs, and also this peg will slot into that slot there. It's really counterintuitive, and I guess it ultimately functions, but it's not something I really like doing. Anyway, once it's all locked up together, you'll notice that tab there and that slot there. This will slot in and these two will peg it together. And we'll clean that up at the end because it's probably going to get f***ed up later as well. Just because of the way it works. You rotate the arms around like so. Fold them upwards and they peg into the sides like so. Bada bing, bada boom. Make sure it's all nice and tight together. And we'll still leave this till later because it's got to plug into the rest of the figure and it's probably going to fall apart again. So yeah, you bring the head up like so, or rather the head platform up like so. Oh, and I forgot to say you push the hands down because otherwise they'll cause clearance issues. You then bring the whole thing and admittedly it does slot kind of well into place and the head locks it into place there. It's a pretty sturdy connection, unlike Magic Square Menasaur, which I've covered in the past. But the engineering to get it to this cube mode is just f***ing. 
correct. Magic Square Menosaur did not need that much engineering to get it to work. It's literally a cube. Beast Box does that shit all the time. It's not that difficult. Anyway, get the f in a place there. There we go. Okay, almost there. F Finally, untab the top so that the head can rotate around and into place. But we won't pop it into place because first we have to open up the torso, rotate this entire double joint out. Come on, get the f out of there. Then you can start to get the arms in place by detransforming them and getting them into position. And then you can start getting that little ratcheted joint out of there and lock everything into place with that. Then this goes all the rest of the way out. Then you can get the backpack back into place because now there's clearance for the head. Also, I just realized I had the head the wrong way around because f me. There's so many joints on this head, it shouldn't be this difficult. Come on, get the f in there. What is your problem? Oh my god. There we go. F but we won't get that in the place yet because now we got to do the legs. Now you have to bring in the sliding rails into place so that they're back in their jet mode configuration. With the feet going in there as well. Hallelujah gesundheit. And yeah, there we are. Should work. You just keep that around and it's good to go. I don't know if it's this way or this way. I'll go check the stock photography later. I'm pretty sure it's this way, but I'm not sure. But yeah, you open up the backpack and you attach the rest in place and that should do it. Yay, we have an arm now. And then of course this guy's the same except as a parts form because he broke out of the box. And then you see these slots here. That is where the arms go. And this slots in place to keep them in place. This joint is the dumbest f combiner joint I have ever seen. That's a screw there. That's going to wear down over time as you transform it. So as these jostle around, it's slowly going to put pressure on that screw. Because it's not a nice solid locking tab, it is going to cause issues with longevity. Oh, but you're not supposed to transform it. It's supposed to stay on a shelf and not do anything, f you. Last but not least, you can see these are tabs on the arms and you can kind of guess what's going to happen from here. You get the arms in the right position and I guess they go around this way after all. Get the hand slotted in and reattach everything. Stay the f in. I'm sick and tired of this. Around we go, because I'm an idiot. Fists together. And I will say, because I don't think I mentioned it anywhere else, I do appreciate that we got such articulated fingers. So that's one of the few good things about this figure. So yeah, the transformation is not as bad, but it's still f***ing shit. Is it the worst combined transformation I've gone through? Not really. Combiner Wars Devastator comes to mind because it's just so underdone. At least all the joints here except the shoulders kind of function. And then Combiner Wars Menosaur was flat out unfinished. What about Legend Scale? Well, definitely. Yeah, it is definitely the worst Legends scaled combiner transformation I've ever seen. This is a real piece of shit, and it is causing so much pain with the filming process. I just want it to end. I'm telling you. I really, really wanted to end. Once again, right off the bat, it's clear where the priorities lie with this release. Out of all three segments pertaining to this set, the combined mode for Superatron is easily the most cohesive. The proportions work the best, though perhaps it's because combiners get the most leeway. It's the most sturdy, and that's not just because of the combiner skeleton. The leg connections finally feel like they were actually done by a competent company, and they carry the design well. Personally, I would have preferred the planes at the front, as I'm partial to the combiner war style, but once again, not every Everyone can be the designer of Magic Square Menosaur. For Simon the Minority here, most collectors want the Toon style. Similarly to Silver Arrow, this is actually starting to look like a Transformer. Uh, careful! Don't mishear me! I said starting to look like a Transformer, not does look. So where exactly does it go wrong? Well, not below the knees, I can tell you that. These are by far the best Legends legs I have ever handled. The feet are hella sturdy and move in plenty of directions for solid posing power. The knees too, which complements the double ratcheted bend quite well. As frustrating as it is to get here, here, the end result works better than most examples I've seen. Hell, even the shins left over from the original units look pretty good to the point where you almost forget they buggered the diecast molding. You wouldn't expect these to be so cohesive given the f***ery of the previous two modes, but no. They look fine and nothing falls out of place. Would have loved some of that solidity in the other two modes, but oh well. Though at this point, I hope you've enjoyed your brief respite because we're about to jump back into the f***ery once more. Once we move up to the thighs, bleh, not the mustard again. I know it was already a thing and it was likely gang molded with silver arrow himself, but again, this doesn't fit an expensive premium release like this. Also, shitty rushed red paint applications. Fantastic. You've got to do better, Senator. Also, why aren't these screwed together properly? Why do they look like they're slowly being pulled apart at the seams? The thighs aren't going to spontaneously combust on me, are they? We're already dealing with enough frustrating longevity issues as is. The hips seem okay. The waist section uses the actually luscious finished red from Flyfire, so it looks pretty good, even with its rather simplistic detail. Individual hip skirts 
shots are nice and the forward kick works well, but oh, what is that sound? Why do the outward ratchets sound like they've got scoliosis? And the further up you go, the worse it gets. This torso... What the hell am I looking at? The dreaded third party syndrome rears its ugly head once more with this deeply lacking approximation. Neither stylized nor accurate once more, you're left with this big plank of nothing. This isn't Superior, at least the stylized Combiner Wars version had the decency to add detail that was actually consistent. This just gives up and settles for the dull metallic red that's already proven lacking and even more haphazard red highlights. And sure, this is merely one layout. You can try to improve the look by going for the toy style chest edition. Trial and fail, that is. Jesus Christ, this is even worse! Yes, the red is done slightly better than the highlights, but now there's a massive color mismatch going on. And since they're trying to fake the torso cavity, it now looks like he's got a beer gut. Congratulations, you've officially forced a gestalt to go on a diet. Still, maybe it'll look better once you remove the chest wing- Ugh, no! Why did you design the joint that way? Get that shit away from me! Great, so you used the most ugly joint imaginable, so now you can't leave these off. So much for choice, you've basically made the choice for your customers through your negligence. Although, while on the topic, this connection is really icky. It doesn't feel like you're solidly locking anything into place, but rather you're stabbing it in there and hoping it'll stick. Think putting up poles of a fence. You sort of bury the pole in the ground and hope that nothing goes wrong. I know again it's hard to show stuff like this on camera, but believe me, this doesn't feel like an intentional locking mechanism. And on the topic of locking mechanisms, why is it every Legends combiner that uses the skeleton system has issues with the back section. Magic Square Menasaur doesn't have proper locking tabs. New Age Long Haul keeps falling out for whatever reason. And now here with Silver Arrow, the backpack is somehow worse than in the robot mode. Every time you grab this thing, something comes undone. Now to guess, I suppose it's because in robot mode, you pick it up from the top. Whereas with combined mode, you grab it by the torso, which puts your grubby fingers all over this plane crash of engineering. Again, I'm perfectly fine with the backpack being this big. My issue is merely the lack of stability. As as well as the weight in robot mode, but that doesn't really apply here. They've over-engineered the shit out of this, and it just isn't fun as a result. From my view, yeah, this is easily the worst combiner backpack I've ever handled. It's like a first-year university essay writer who seems to think adding more words to an essay makes him seem smarter. Being verbose to verbosely engage in verbosity doesn't make you smart, it just makes you seem like a tryhard, and this is the engineering equivalent of that. But nothing, I mean nothing, compared to the arms. First off, these connections are asking for trouble. The Combiner Wars spring system is right there. You're already using a skeleton. You can use whatever connection port you want. But then you get further out and there's virtually nothing right with this. The torsos are held together with this absolutely weak source chest panel and it simply refuses to stay in place sometimes due to the weight of the lower arms. They've been so concerned with weight all this time that they've loaded a shit ton of die cast in the front of the damn thing, but they didn't take this into account. But say that you actually can keep this in place for a short while. How's the rest of the posing? Basically non-existent. Because the f kibble keeps getting in the way! I don't mind kibble. I want companies to embrace it more. But for a moment, let's compare these to the Masterpiece Gut Eye train bots. What's the difference about those in comparison to this? When you try to pose them, the kibble doesn't get in the way. When you try to pose to Peritron, it keeps clashing and getting in the way. There are three joints in the elbow, and hypothetically they make posing a dream, but with this bullshit in the way, it just doesn't work. And keep in mind, this is with the kibble facing backwards, like in the stock configuration. This is designed to keep it out of the way so the posing works better, and it's still still doesn't work. And sure, you can shove the kibble to the side to get a bit of extra posing on the left side. Don't do that with catapult. He's already falling to f***ing pieces. As a result, the most important part of any articulation section, being the arms, is kneecapped, or I guess elbow capped. Consequently, you cannot get this guy in any dynamic poses. It's really frustrating too, because there are plenty of specialty joints here for the intent of dynamicism. You've got a sideways torso joint, something I've never seen on a combiner, and even shifting hips so that he can kick all the way up. This is the makings of the most poseable combiner of all time, and they didn't bother thinking any of this through. It's an absolute mess. Legitimately, you have an easier time posing old as f Hulky. That toy came out eight years ago. Eight f 
years ago. Somehow we're regressing with design here. We should be moving forward, but they've gone in the opposite direction. Not even the accessories can save this monstrosity. Cool that the smaller guns fit inside the larger ones, but now it rattles around, feeling super cheap in the process. Not that you can pose this thing with a gun anyway, given, you know. And he has an alternate comic style head, but whoopsie, they didn't make the mouth section a different piece that slots in later. So they haven't been able to paint the thing to the edges. Seriously, I could have painted this better. At every goddamn point, this figure has fumbled over and over and over. There have been issues, both major and minor. If I were to list every individual flaw I've discussed so far, the list would be comparable to the runtime of the collective Doctor Who classic series. Often with rubbish toys, writing the script is really easy. You talk about the toy, make a couple of jokes, exaggerate the anger in the recording session, and hey presto, funny video for everyone to enjoy. Not this time. I have been struggling to keep this script as short as possible, making every flaw concise yet clear. I'm on page 17 at the moment. If I wasn't using every ounce of my focus, I'd be on page 40, endlessly repeating myself and getting sucked into my own anger. Also, you may have noticed something. Throughout this video, I have not once referred to these by their Generation 1 names. Normally, I don't bother with third-party names unless in comparison discussions or something similar. This time, I simply cannot. These are not the aerial bots. These are closer to the dollar store knockoffs of the aerial bots. You got slingshot? No, we have catch hill. What about skydive? You mean ground jump? <laughs> You're being f ridiculous. Tell me you got air We have carbon dioxide shadow legends. Firefly! Serenity? Silver bolts! Oh, bronze nut! <laughs> Oh yeah, we got, we got tons of aerial bots. Oh, at least tell me you have Alpha Bravo. We got Zeta Disappointment. I will send you to Jesus! And at the end of it all, you know what? The perfect allegory was already covered back in the vehicle modes. The guns use square pegs to enter round holes. Square peg round hole. Zeta has tried to forcibly shove their haphazard masterpiece engineering into the Legends paradigm. They've ignored all the subtleties of the scale, all of the advancements made by other companies, and insisted they can do their own thing and still be successful. The end result is a release that exudes runaway hubris, a failure of design on almost every level that makes perfect sense given the circumstances. The score for this figure is painfully obvious. There is no other grade I can bestow upon Zeta Superatron. Even now, the lowest of the low doesn't adequately describe the depths this figure plunges to. It is not worthy of the superior name, and it sure as shit isn't worthy of being classified as a Transformer. I've had a long, hard think about how bad this figure actually is, and whether it's worse than other figures I've covered before. In comparison to figures I've owned previously, yeah, it's not that bad. Thunderleader's list of issues was much shorter, but he leans hard into those issues. Hell, he isn't even the worst Legends figure I've ever handled. I'd sooner convert this than I would handle hybrid style Black Convoy again, even with the breakage issues. He's also probably not the worst combiner of all time, there's tough competition in that area. Devil Savior says hello, and X Transbots Menasaur would probably do the same if he didn't crumble to pieces due to the combiner joints destroying themselves. But in terms of combiners I've handled and owned, I can't think of anything worse than this, official or unofficial. Don't even bother bringing Combiner Wars Menasaur into the mix, doesn't even compare. At every point, something has gone wrong. Nearly everything with this this figure is f***ed in some regard. You can pick a random part of this figure and you'd be more likely to find an issue with it than you would something right. And on today's show, we are going to find out, is there a body part on Zeta Superatron Mini that doesn't suck donkey dick? Name a part. Um, nope. Shimmel all up the wazoo, bits f***ing fallen off mid-transformation, or rather out of the box. Not to mention it doesn't pose properly because the thing gets in the way and it falls apart as you're posing it. What about the knees? Actually, the knees are... All right. That, that's that's one body part that's all right. What about the chest? Ah, that's also shit. Don't forget that it's got terrible tooling that washes out all the mechanical detail. It's inaccurate to both the tune and the toy, so you can't use that as an excuse. The paint is garbage. Uh, a whole bunch of stuff like terrible joints and it's going to fall apart over time because f Zeta. What about the clearest though? Uh, I'm sorry, what? I know what I said. Uh, 
anyway. You may have also noticed I've rarely used the excuse asset that often excuses issues of this size. I've received criticism for its supposed overuse, but here's the thing. Legends figures are small. There's only so much you can do at the scale before you start to bog the design down with overcomplication and general fuckery. The reason it hasn't shown up as much here, if at all, is because the excuse can only be used so much. A few small errors can be excused on a small Legends figure, but as we've seen, it's more than just a few. Eventually, you get to the point where enough is enough. Eventually, the designers have to pull their head out of their ass and actually put some effort in. And yes, it is a homage to Superion. There are no other versions of this character on the market at this scale. But newsflash, you think Magic Square and New Age won't do their own? Both Devastators are roughly the same size as this already, so you can't even bring scale into the argument. There is virtually no reason to purchase this release. Yes, it is cheaper than most of the other combiners. Doubly so when you consider they're releasing a reissued box set at an even lower price, but that price comes with its own terrible costs. If value is a concern to you, just forego the scale and get the Combiner Wars version. It's a far superior toy in every way, even without the upgrade kits. And some depictions of Combiners mess around with scale anyway, so you can always use that argument. This toy doesn't have a reason to exist. Already Zeta's masterpiece offerings are being outdone by other companies with their takes on Combiners. As a company, there are better options of practically every figure they've released. Yes, even Radiotron. Y'all keep complaining about MPG Raiden, but aside from the proportional issues in combined mode, it's superior in practically every way. Zeta has failed in basically every market, and as has always been the case, there is no reason, no audience, that I could recommend this to. And yet, this figure is selling quite well. In fact, it's selling like hotcakes, enough for them to fudge out a box set at a cheaper price. Beyond that, rumor has it they're working on a downscaled Bruticus next, as if Terion wasn't bad enough. It makes me wonder. Why? Why is this figure doing so well in the face of such issues? Well, this is the final fuckery this figure brings us. It's the last step on the road to pure Legends depression. Zeta Superatron Mini is a truly heinous figure in all aspects, but it's also the future of what third-party Legends will become. I've been with this niche since it has begun, way back with the first releases of Iron Factory and DX9. From the get-go, I have understood what Legends represents, and it's why I was so drawn to it. In the third-party space, Legends has traditionally been a niche within a niche. The big bucks have always been in Masterpiece. I've spoken to many store owners and they've confirmed it. Until recently, more people have been collecting 3PMP than Legends. Thing is, there's a certain paradigm that is said niche's biggest strength as well as its greatest weakness. As a reviewer, I like to consider all aspects of a figure. This includes display options, paintwork, engineering, articulation, materials, aesthetic. A transformer has to balance all of these in order to deliver a well-rounded experience. Most third-party masterpiece collectors, however, prioritize only a few of these. Typically, they only focus on accuracy, articulation, and scale. As the years went by, the balance was shifted towards these factors, which is how companies like Zeta were able to get a foothold to begin with. For a collector like myself, however, it feels like the things we want are being excluded. It's entirely possible to adhere to these three primary factors and still deliver a well-rounded experience. I got X-Transbot's breakdown for 20 bones and I think his f***ing awesome. But compare that to their Megatron, their Ultra Magnus. Hell, look at the rest of the Combiner. It's not even designed to be transformed multiple times since otherwise it crumbles to pieces. Releases like this dominated the third party world for years and it felt like my and many others' sensibilities were being ignored. Then along comes Iron Factor. Factory. Through a sheer fluke of designing an upgrade kit for Metroplex, they kick off a whole separate niche. Instead of pure accuracy, Fun Factor is prioritized. Not to say these figures weren't accurate, they were still reasonably so, it's just the point was always the experience rather than the aesthetic. Then the years pass by, and no matter what third party goes through, Legends always remains consistent. Even when companies metamorphosize, even when the landscape changes, even when aesthetics ebb and flow, Legends has always been there to offer consistently fun experiences experiences. But now, something has changed. Not with Legends itself, mind you, or at least not with Legends directly. Rather, it's with third-party masterpiece. People collect for multiple reasons, but usually there are two groups you can split 3PMP into. There are those
those who buy whatever looks neat, like myself, and those who have an end goal in mind. Although it might not seem like it, both these types of people collect third-party masterpiece. Or rather, they did collect third-party masterpiece. The pool for characters is slowly but surely drying up. There aren't that many G1 characters left that still need doing. It's getting to the point where some collectors are simply packing up and quitting collecting. Their goal is done so they can retire. This puts the companies into a frenzy. Sales dropping left and right, but instead of moving away from G1, they start remaking figures that have already been covered. Was anyone actually asking for another two Ultra Magni? Not particularly, but that's where we're going now. Ironically, this is actually alienating the other half of the group those who collect whatever they feel like. People are being less inclined to pick up modern releases, since they've done the whole song and dance before. The love these people have had for third-party masterpiece is waning as people either pack up shop or get alienated. And this isn't even taking into consideration corporate shadiness, such as the DX9 designers quitting due to poor pay, fans toys designers quitting over pricing disputes, leaving Menace or unfinished, new companies popping up only to vanish because the designs weren't real to begin with. Lost and confused, these people need another place to find love for the franchise. And sure, some of them go to the official Hasbro figures, but not a lot of them. The ingrained Haztac hatred is something that's hard to deprogram, just as it's near impossible to convince someone who hates third party to give it a try. And then they discover third party legends. Consistent releases, reasonable accuracy, ease of completion, general high quality. And so, a huge flux of former third party masterpiece fans enter the legends fray, forever changing what the core audience of the niche wants. I don't want to gatekeep by any means. Any product should be accessible to the majority of people, and to deny that right is stupid and arrogant. That said, I cannot deny this release and what it brings makes me melancholic. For the past several Legends reviews, I have always insisted that Legends should be primarily for play and not display. Transformations and ease of use should be prioritized, and accuracy always needs some leeway. It's the same philosophy I apply to all Transformers, official or unofficial, Legends, Chug, or Masterpiece. However, there's a shifting tide. Every time I make a video with these criticisms, the pushback keeps getting louder. What Legends means is slowly but surely changing, and Superatron is a sign of the times. The people who have been with the niche since the very beginning are mattering less and less as an influx of fans with greater disposable income overtakes the system and places their own priorities in the forefront. It's no surprise that New Age is slowly but surely moving closer and closer to the Sunbow designs, remaking their old figures to fit more in with that aesthetic. You start to see parallels with certain companies companies making the same mistakes over and over. Yes, the audience twists them as positives and places them on a pedestal above all else. This toy isn't the worst figure I've ever handled, but it does make me frustrated in a way no other toy has. It's a signifier that Legends has moved on, and effectively, left me behind. Once more, I'm not going to criticize those who like this new direction. Different people take different aspects and interpret them in a multitude of ways. You may have watched this video and disagreed with every single point I have made, and that's perfectly valid. This is why fandom public consciousness is a conversation, a dialogue back and forth. The objective is but a myth, and what you like is both simultaneously good and bad, depending on the stance of the person. That said, I'm not going to lie about the way I feel about figures. I'm not going to pretend these flaws don't matter from my perspective. I'm not going to pretend I feel people should support this kind of trash with very little effort put in. Even with the context and the changing tide, this toy remains rubbish. I'm also not going to pretend that I agree with the changing tide. I never wanted this. I criticized it for years, and now that it's come, I think it's time to take my leave. I'm never going to stop collecting small-scale figures. Iron Factory and New Age are still going strong, and Hasbro's core class has been doing amazingly as of late. At least for the most part. The Legendary Marathon is never going away. I'm aware it was nixed this year due to frustrating external circumstances, but this video and the last one were both plans of what it should have been. The Marathon will most certainly return I've already been brainstorming ideas for the new one, but for the past several years, I have classified myself as a Legends completionist, with the goal of collecting one of each mold. That is no longer going to be the case. Companies are slowly but surely prioritizing the opposite of what made me love Legends in the first place, and where they go, I cannot follow. Might pick up the occasional magic square just to see how things are doing, but I'm not actively engaging in what I perceive as their delusions. Zeta can put out as many combiners as they like, but I sure as shit aren't giving them a shot. Hell, make a downscaled Raiden for all I care, see if I bother buying it. Effective immediately, consider this my retirement from Legends completionism. I'll stick in the remaining lanes I have left. For those who love this release and those like it, 
I hope you enjoy what the future holds. And with that, I think I'm done. Normally I do the whole outro spiel, but at this point, I'm too out of it. This video has honestly taken it out of me, and I'm not in the mood. I really gotta balance things out with some positive videos after this. I can't be writing 15,000 word video essays on critical topics all the time. But hey, at least it's done. At least I can forget about it. I mean, it's not like there's anything worse Zeta can do at this point. Introducing Toy Easy Gustav. Basically, we took the experimental Nazi cannon and turned it into a Nazi officer robot. Now you can bring the fascism into your home with realistic brutality action. Obviously, we did not do a Google search to check if it would actually be currently acceptable, but we really don't care. We're an arm of a company that makes propaganda toys anyway, so this is right up our alley. Toy Easy Gustav, because fascism is the future. Yeah, I'm never f buying anything from Zeta ever again.